did. Let's delve now into some of the highlights of the Skinner European Furniture and Decorative Arts Auction. First, I wanna look at uh, a wonderful carved bust of this English gentleman. Um, and there's some suspicion about where the origin of this bust came from. It's this wonderfully solid piece of singular wood. Um, but George always mentioned that he suspected it could have come from a headboard, uh, which you can see here. We're also interested in who the subject of uh, this particular bust was. Now, some speculate that it was possibly Sir Walter Raleigh. Um, George always suspected it was probably Charles I. Uh, I think in the two paintings that you see here, you can clearly see uh, the sash that's carved on the bust, um, sort of reminiscent of the sashes in these two portraits of Charles I. Uh, certainly the ruff uh, with the lace tips uh, turned down um, is very similar to that of the bust. Uh, so who knows? George certainly believed it was Charles I. Uh, either way, very elegantly carved gentleman. Here we have a series of decorative arts items that are in the auction. Um, three continental silver beakers, uh, a particular interest, also an interest for George of Charles I on the far right, uh, is a emblem of Charles I with his wife, Henrietta Maria, um, probably owned uh, by some royalist uh, who was supporter of the king and wanted it to be known whenever they were drinking that they were a royal supporter. Um, here we have two wonderful boxes uh, that are part of one lot. Um, the one on the right is particularly wonderful. Uh, despite uh, missing one triangular mirror um, on the front door panel, uh, it does have a key and lock. Um, inside uh, is a wonderful series of drawers with little drawer pulls. Um, most notably about it uh, are the small little ball feet that it sits on. Um, these particular boxes typically back in the 17th century would house uh, spices, which were very valuable uh, and important for the family. So they would be kept under lock and key. Um, but you can see that this is clearly a, a, a centerpiece of a home. Here we have this wonderful uh, Delft vase. Uh, it has a very curious sort of scene on it. There's a gentleman in a hat uh, who has his hands to his face. Um, the woman is balancing very uh, precariously a vase on her head. Um, I'm not sure what that story is. Um, maybe it's something having to do with a amorous love affair um, and the precariousness of it, I'm not sure. Uh, but just wonderful decoration, just covering the entire thing. And this was a, a piece that George um, would include in a number of exhibitions. Uh, as I mentioned, the Huguenot Street exhibition, that was, it was also included in that. Um, here we have uh, one of a series of wonderful boxes that George had collected. Um, I just want to note uh, this one is dated uh, with the 17th, 1676. Um, the initials are probably by the original owner who commissioned it. Uh, the Gadroon carved front and very simple austere ornament uh, is quite lovely. Um, it has an original hasp, uh, it looks like, at the top, and it still has the keyhole. Here's another wonderful uh, slant top box. Um, it appears to have original hardware. Uh, it has also uh, initials of a former owner, MR, at the very top. Um, suspect it's probably Dutch. Uh, it looks like it has these tulip car foliates uh, at the bottom of the frieze. Here we have a, a wonderful lot of four tobacco boxes. Um, each of them individually are all really exquisite. Uh, they have really lovely wear from the owners uh, taking them in and out of their pockets uh, to fill their pipes with tobacco. Um, but the one in the upper right is the one that's, to me, most interesting. Uh, it has this large, wide frieze uh, of a kind of landscape. And it's hard to tell in all of the Baroque ornament. Uh, but in the bottom left, there is a figure that's sort of sitting at the shore. And the text, which is somewhat difficult and worn away to make out at the very center, uh, has a reference to America. So it's possible this person was a sailor uh, who traveled between um, Holland and, and the Netherlands and down to perhaps the Caribbean. Uh, another series of tobacco boxes, um, really wonderful, uh, each and every one of them. Um, the one on the bottom left is of particular interest. Uh, it has this central figure, which is 
perhaps a soldier. Um, and to the right is a doorway with uh, what looks like a commander or some militia um, standing behind them. It looks like he's being called away to war. Uh, but sadly, his wife is still in bed in the back and the left saying farewell. Here we have a series of uh, wonderful candlesticks. Uh, again, many of these, the majority of these were featured in the Wick and the Stick exhibition. Um, of particular note in this lot is the central one with the barley twist stem and the square base. Um, the stick at the far uh, left uh, with the three feet triangular base um, and the very high drip pan is a really wonderful example as well. Uh, they all have a wonderful wear to them. Getting into the furniture, um, here we have this wonderful uh, chest, lift top chest. Um, very simple geometric design, again, much like the boarded box that we were looking at, uh, arcaded frieze at the top, um, very simple, clean uh, style legs and wonderful um, wear to it. Uh, the next chest uh, we're looking at, um, this probably was a uh, wedding gift of some kind. It's got a wonderful carved MM70, uh, possibly 1670 uh, motif along the top frieze. Um, you can see how these rosettes uh, in the three panels on the front uh, also uh, echo two hearts, um, which could indicate that this was possibly a wedding gift. Uh, here's a really wonderful uh, chest of drawers uh, with inlay wood in the two front panels, the extensive geometric uh, work that's on the front of those doors. Um, it also sits on two bun feet, uh, which one of them is stamped. Um, the central drawer has an additional inlay and carved motif of checkerboard um, and, and just extensive geometric work. It's, it's really a wonderful piece. Uh, here we have this wonderful cupboard, which was uh, featured in the Dutch exhibition celebrating the 400th anniversary of Hudson. Um, this one is just another one of those wonderful pieces that George had that uh, was fantastic in carved um, elements, uh, the lunette friezes uh, above the doors, um, the three figures that are engaged at the top. Um, just a really, really extraordinary piece. Uh, and this is actually a pretty good photograph showing many of the, the highlights of the, of the depth of the carving. Um, there's also two uh, heads that are carved into the central uh, diamond patterns. Um, and as you can see, it's sitting on those three wonderful large bun feet. Uh, here's another piece. This was uh, a piece that George uh, spotted while he was at a restaurant. Um, he took a lot of time to convince the owner to sell it to him. They didn't understand why it was so wonderful, uh, but he convinced them to do so. And when they parted with it, George acquired uh, one of the centerpieces of his living room. Uh, here's a wonderful uh, double three-tiered cupboard. Um, this was a piece that George acquired from a uh, auction house on 10th Street in Manhattan. Um, it had a label inside of it from Partridge, uh, London. Um, indicating that it originated from there. Uh, George actually transported this piece uh, first from the, the, the drawers themselves home um, and then piece by piece brought the other ones home, if you can imagine him on the Staten Island Ferry doing so. Here's a wonderful uh, high cabinet. I just want to note uh, the wonderful carved bird that's on the door, um, the wonderful carving of the two drawers at the bottom of the foliate. Uh, I want to remind everyone, George was really fascinated by Charles II. Uh, this was definitely the era of the restoration to the throne. Um, this was when uh, England was flourishing in the arts again. Uh, and George was always uh, reminding people as they looked at furniture uh, in his collection um, about the adoration of this crown, but also the symbolism uh, of that crown, which can be seen in many of the items. So as we look at some of these side chairs, um, you'll notice the uh, chair in the center um, with the wonderful uh, solid back um, is punctuated at the top by a crown. Here we have another wonderful uh, piece that also features the crown. Um, it has these wonderful carved foliate arms. Uh, 
the rectangular backsplat with additional English indication of the roses along there. Uh, here's a, a wonderful ensemble of chairs. Uh, again, armchairs that are decorated uh, with foliates uh, at the tips of where the arms would rest. Um, there's, a, there's a wonderful oval back uh, splat here in this collection. Um, the, uh, the front splats with additional crowns uh, and all sorts of S scrolls. Um, the chair in the far back on the right uh, has a wonderful putti uh, as well as uh, what look like rosette uh, finials at the top. Um, these are two of George's favorite chairs, uh, two Daniel Moreau styled. Um, you can see the perforated carved back splats uh, with a sort of urn. Um, and really exquisitely carved uh, foliates all throughout. Uh, the serpentine uh, stretcher at the base uh, with the sort of inverted uh, finial. Uh, this was also a very modest looking piece, um, but one of George's favorites. Uh, when he went to the Brooklyn Museum uh, and he was learning more about this period, he always admired a particular bench that was in the Schenck house. Uh, so he was very excited when he found this piece. Um, the frieze that you see at the top of the base is sort of the most decorative element of the entire thing. Um, but these particular benches are quite rare. Many of the stools that you would see, join stools and so forth, uh, are a little bit more common and have been available at auction, but these benches are a little bit more rare. Um, here we can see some of those joined stools. Uh, we have some caned examples as well as uh, a stool that George was particularly fond of in the back left, uh, which had these ball turned legs, um, a really wonderful stool piece. Uh, the bed, the magnificent bed. Uh, here we have uh, some wonderful views uh, that are available on the website. Uh, you can really appreciate the scale of it, um, the real decadence of it. Uh, these gadrooned um, columns that support it, but they're Corinthian tops. Uh, additional carving down at the foot. Um, that headboard uh, with the, the garter uh, of the Knights of St. George. Uh, you can see the engaged figures uh, on the right, as well as the iconic lion head uh, of English rule. Um, of particular interest about this bed, uh, when George first acquired it uh, in the 80s, uh, he was inspecting it and looking through it. Um, and he noticed that there was this label on top of the bed. Uh, and so we only have fragments of what it actually said. Um, we just know that it had something to do with a Lord Chomley, that it was transported. Um, the date is an interesting indication. Uh, if it was 1638, that's just a few years before the English Civil War. Um, so we're not sure what this is. This is a good thing for uh, some provenance research um, to learn more about it, but clearly a very valuable indication of the age of the bed. Uh, here's a better shot of the headboard, um, and I've inserted uh, the garter, and, and what you can see uh, are the fleur-de-lis uh, indicating, um, as well as the lines indicating the era of Elizabeth I. Uh, George had some correspondence um, with son of the Arms College in England uh, to try to confirm this, which they indicated was it was definitely something that was used by Elizabeth I. Um, I'm not saying Elizabeth I slept in it, but clearly this bed is uh, really extraordinary in its uh, heraldry. It's extraordinary in its carving um, and definitely uh, one of the magnificent things in this particular auction. Um, paintings, uh, George, uh, again, fascinated by Charles I. Uh, this is a really wonderful, a rendered uh, image of Charles I in profile, um, beautiful lace fallen collar. Uh, clearly this was done in, in some period of time after uh, the Van Dyke portraits uh, that were commissioned of Charles I, which were used for uh, the reason why you see the three different perspectives was because it was a painting that was sent to the sculptor Benini to try to create a bust of Charles I. Um, here we see another small intimate portrait of Charles I. Again, wonderful lace collar. You see the sashes. Uh, here's Charles I's son, the second, um, with his wonderful plumed hat. Uh, this was a piece that George uh, had brought to a restorer to start 
doing some cleaning. You can see uh, what a wonderful piece it is, the lace at the base of his chest. Um, Charles II was a huge fan of these big plumed hats. Um, he appears in many portraits uh, with those hats. So whoever does acquire this, um, strongly recommend obviously cleaning it. Uh, it was in a very smoky or just 400 years old of soot, um, but it needs a good cleaning and probably a wonderful piece. Um, we have Oliver Cromwell, um, obviously the nemesis of Charles I. Uh, he, along with John Pym, clearly were the launch of the English Civil War. Um, we have, uh, as Americans, uh, a debt that we owe to them. They are really the ones who inspired the uh, American Revolution and parliamentary system and separation from the crown. Um, this particular piece uh, after the Robert Walker portrait, which is at the National Gallery, um, you can see that Oliver Cromwell is holding the baton in, an indir in a similar uh, way. Um, here we have a wonderful early uh, gentleman with a fallen collar. You can see the sort of silk highlights on his collar as well as the very delicate lace work. Um, he appears to be wearing a pendant. Uh, probably wouldn't take too much work to determine who the sitter was. That little curl at the top of the part of his hair is an indication. Uh, here we have a portrait of a man uh, that George was always convinced was uh, Wenzel Haller, um, based on this particular print. Um, Wenzel Haller, we know, was a very famous uh, etcher in England. Um, I'm not sure why he would be holding a quill pen, um, but it's possible that maybe he was doing a drawing for one of his etchings. Um, here we have a wonderful uh, portrait, uh, again, of a man with a wonderfully extraordinary lace collar. I just want to note within those uh, foliates of the lace work, you can see individual crests. Uh, and within those individual crests, it seems like they all are very distinct. Um, perhaps some uh, scholar of heraldry would be able to indicate who this person is. Um, but again, another really wonderfully rendered uh, portrait. Uh, here's a, uh, a rare piece, a full length portrait of a young boy. Um, elegantly dressed uh, from head to toe, ribbons on his shoes. Uh, the hat is a curious piece. If you notice the shape of the hat and you notice the shape of the hair of the young boy, it's as if he's just taking it off. Um, he holds this little staff. Uh, perhaps he was a little aristocrat. Um, here's another wonderful early portrait. Uh, again, extraordinary rough collar. Uh, tipped with wonderful little lace detailing. Um, his face is just beautifully modeled. The facial hair itself is just exquisitely rendered. Um, here we have another portrait. Uh, this is uh, believed to possibly be the Earl of Exeter. It's indicated on the back. Um, I don't know uh, enough about the heraldry at the upper left. It's uh, Welsh dragon. Um, it's possible that that might be another indication of who this person is. Here we have a, a wonderful uh, portrait that is an extraordinary quintessential Baroque frame. Uh, this, if you can see how it's perforated, uh, you can see the reddish color behind where the uh, gold uh, car foliate is. Um, this George always believed was the Prince of Orange. Um, you can see in some of these other portraits, uh, the one, one key indication aside from the wonderfully rendered lace collar and the beard and the hair uh, is that double chin. Um, I don't know how many any how many Dutch princes had that same double chin, but clearly this was done after that particular portrait. Uh, here we have a wonderful uh, seated merchant. Um, there's lots of a uh, whole story to be told in this particular portrait. Uh, on the table next to him uh, is a orange, uh, probably indicating that he was a you know, citrus uh, involved in the West Indies, in the Caribbean. Uh, there's also uh, an indication of his age in the upper right corner. Uh, he was believed to be 32 years old. His portrait is dated 1632. Um, there's wonderful fallen lace collar that is tipped with additional delicate lace work. Uh, this glove that he holds in his hands, uh, perhaps symbolic of if he is a businessman, that he is someone to be trusted. He's got his gloves off. You can see his hands. Um, he's saying, I'm someone who can be trusted. 
Uh, I also want to note this uh, chair that he's sitting on. Um, George was particularly keen on uh, always looking at paintings and seeing the elements of the paintings. Uh, so this is actually, fortunately, a lot that's in the auction, um, two chairs, uh, which has wonderful twisted uh, stems and arms and a front splat. Here we have an extraordinary uh, portrait of very beautifully rendered uh, rough, possibly Thomas de Kaiser's school of. Uh, another wonderful piece, uh, really, really warm rendering of the face and the facial pier, uh, the escrow collar, um, just very lightly, almost a wet paint application. Uh, there's a wonderful lot of 10 miniatures, uh, each one of them really wonderful and extraordinary. Um, I know George was particularly keen on this one old lady. Uh, it was something that, um, you know, he was really, really enjoyed the genre renderings of everyday people aside from the Charles I and the Charles II. Um, but this particular woman is a subject uh, that many artists, including Franz Halls, uh, rendered. Um, so there is some indication that this is a very frequent subject, uh, possibly the, you know, drunken old lady at the tavern who's telling all sorts of tales of yesteryear. Here we have a, a really wonderful piece, uh, very tightly cropped, um, of a gentleman. Uh, George was always in love with the translucency of the fabric of the fallen collar where you can see the belt uh, rendered through that. Um, just really a, a wonderfully uh, executed piece by, by a really extraordinary artist. Um, here we see a, a piece that is uh, from the school of Gabriel Metsu um, holding a pipe. Uh, again, just another everyday scene, you know, enjoying a beverage, having a little smoke. Another uh, wonderful piece, uh, possibly from the school of Jan Steen. Um, again, just casually taking a puff of smoke. You can see the little smoke uh, rings coming up from the pipe. Uh, here's a somewhat uh, salacious piece. Um, we see at the bottom left, there's a crib. Uh, we can't see if there's a baby in it. Um, it appears that the gentleman with his rosy cheeks uh, could possibly be propositioning this woman. Um, there's a rather odd scene happening at the back left. A man seems to be urinating against the wall. Um, quite, the, quite the little melodrama going on in this particular piece. Um, here's a really wonderful uh, barn dance scene. Um, you can almost hear the fiddle music playing. Uh, one of the many landscapes that George had, um, which really just captured that everyday scene in Holland. Uh, here's a piece that, again, uh, sort of a curious uh, depiction of a man who appears to have fleas. He's scratching away furiously at his chest. Um, you see this sort of reminiscent of a Metsu arch, uh, which was a compositional feature of a lot of that painter's work. Um, again, another piece uh, that is possibly attributed to Metsu. Uh, if we take a little bit closer look at it, um, you can see a little bit more of what's going on. Uh, the silk of the dress is just so beautifully rendered, the sheen. Um, you can see the gentleman on the far left uh, as he approaches. He seems to be bearing some gifts. Perhaps he's a uh, wannabe lover, or perhaps he's just simply a hunter who has brought some pheasants and, and fauna for her. Um, the dog uh, is a wonderful little feature at the bottom of her dress, sort of beckoning her, but also, as we know, a symbol of loyalty. Uh, here's another wonderful piece. Uh, George collected just a handful of these uh, sort of biblical scenes. Um, here's Rebecca at the well. Uh, here is uh, one of the stars of um, several exhibitions that George put together. Um, on the left is the work that is in the exhibition, uh, which you can see is really beautifully rendered these little hens. Um, to the right uh, is a work that we believe it's after, Francis Barlow. Uh, Cows, uh, Dutch merchants um, love to celebrate their livestock. Uh, the light that is emanating from the sky down, uh, you know, sort of the, the warm rays of sun and prosperity of the Dutch. Uh, this is one of the rare uh, still lifes that George had in his collection. Um, again, sort of depicting, you know, as many still lifes did, the ephemeral nature, uh, fruit being peeled. Um, the wonderful little highlight and glistening of the wine glass. Uh, 
There's a wonderful collection uh, in this series and this lot of miniatures. Um, a particular interest is the wonderful figure on the right. Uh, I have hope that that was a very lightweight um, collar ruff. Uh, looks like he probably might have gotten a neck injury, um, but clearly uh, wonderfully rendered um, and you know so exquisitely tiny. Uh, it's 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 uh, just a just a wonderful piece of ensemble. Uh, another one, um, looking at some of the women in the miniatures, uh, this collection of six portraits. Um, it's possible that the one in the center at the above could be Elizabeth. Um, there were many uh, admirers of hers, obviously. Uh, so there were many keepsake portraits of her. Um, one thing that George was always really fascinated by was uh, the headdress and the, and the sort of pearls. Um, which we can see here is sort of a or indication of that. Um, here we have a, a wonderful piece, another symbolic piece. Uh, this is after the school of Peter Paul Rubens. Um, this particular still life uh, is wonderful for its stillness. Uh, you can see a reflection on the water of how tranquil the scene is, early morning fishermen. Uh, the tree is just beautifully, beautifully rendered. Um, there's a wax seal on the back of a crown uh, and some sort of what appears to be feathers. Um, this is a very jovial little landscape scene with dancers uh, in the foreground. You see um, quite the little celebration going on midday. Uh, here we have a wonderful piece that really captures one of those Dutch skies. Uh, it's a scene though of an ambush about to occur. Um, you can see the village in the far distance. Uh, here's a piece that's about the devastation of a house fire in the foreground uh, in the darkness and in the stillness is a family just huddled together. Um, here we see a, a wonderful one of the seascapes. Uh, you see the tattered uh, Dutch flag in the upper left. You see the uh, ship being abandoned and the sailors going away. Uh, there's a couple wonderful um, works of paper. Uh, here the piece on the upper right uh, of the figures, possibly a study for a painting. Um, there's another wonderful lot of series of famed etchings, again, of everyday scenes of Holland. Uh, again, another series, a uh, wonderful scene of render things, the red Conte um, drawings are just exquisite. Uh, there's this extraordinary Charles II, the letter, um, which has a date indicated on it of 1673 and also has a symbol uh, embossed in the upper left. Um, there's just so many wonderful, extraordinary treasures. Uh, and I really thank you um, for your time uh, today to take a look at these. I hope that I've uh, provided a little bit of insight um, into some of George's thing. And uh, let's take a look and see if there's uh, any questions. Patrick, can you see the questions? If not, I will ask you the questions. Yeah, go ahead. I um, seem to be outside of that frame. Okay. Um, Kathleen Matthews would like to, you to share some of the stories around the hidden gems that he found in unexpected places. Unexpected places. Uh, so one item, um, there's so many. Uh, I mean, the, the, the cupboard that he found at the restaurant one night while he was dining was, was one of the really wonderful pieces. Um, there's some items that are not in the auction, but it's, I mean, they make for good stories. There was a extraordinary Baroque pulley uh, that was in the Wick and the Stick exhibition in 2010, which was being used as a doorstop on the second floor of an antique shop. Um, that was, uh, you know, just a wonderful little piece. Uh, but yeah, so there's, there's many little, there's many little stories um, to be told about George's, you know, things. It, went, it didn't just come from, antique shops or, or uh, auctions and so forth. I mean, he really, he was always on looking for something just like when he found that Revolutionary War button in the ground in Valley Forge. Patrick, are there uh, any publications that people could find out there on George Way and his collection and some of the exhibitions? Yeah, uh, if you wanna know a little bit more about George, um, again, there was a wonderful, uh, catalog that was produced um, by Historic Huguenot in New Paltz uh, when he did his period room there. Um, the, uh, the catalog is a wonderful essay in it. Uh, that's still available. Um, I mean, I recently got copies as late as last year uh, to give to a friend. Um, 
I would also encourage you if you want to know a little bit more about George, there's some great videos on YouTube of him speaking about his collection um, that are very uh, uh, insightful as well. Okay, a few more questions that have come in. Uh, did George leave research files of his collection? And if so, uh, what will happen to this material? Uh, there is a, a banker's box of papers um, of George's uh, very also Baroque script um, that are a little bit difficult to read. Um, the estate has been in the process of trying to uh, organize them, obviously chronologically, and see what kind of relevance they have. Um, there's a lot of writing that is uh, his life story, which sadly, because of his sudden passing, he wasn't able to actually put down to paper. Um, but a lot of that is writing from that. There's uh, some correspondence um, between you know, him and other museums and historic sites. Uh, that's also there. We're, we're hoping to make that available. Um, but again, it's, uh, it's a big archiving project. Um, but yes, you know, certainly we hope to, to be able to make that uh, and share that with uh, museums and historic houses. And another question, aside from paintings, the picture frames are quite wonderful. Uh, where did he find these? Or did these come with the paintings? Or did he associate them? Uh, yeah, it's, I would say the majority of the paintings came with the frames that they were in. Um, but certainly, uh, George was purchasing frames, uh, you know, oftentimes he would go to a flea market um, and see some really extraordinary, exquisite frames missing their paintings wherever the masterpiece had gone. And he would either cut them down, have them cut down um, to fit a frame. Uh, but most of the paintings have their, you know, the frames that they, that he purchased them with. Um, there's very few that I understand that he had uh, frames put to. I mean, they're, because they're carved, you know, many of these panels, uh, wood panels are, you know, they're kind of, it's not like a standard size. So the frames had to be very um, custom made to fit the dimensions of those panels. Uh, so a lot of those frames really, really came with the, the paintings themselves. And did George do most of his buying in the United States? Uh, I mean, George collected from all over the world. Uh, he was, you know, really keen on finding things in person. Um, I mean, he would drive all over the country and hit antique shops and pop in and make road trips out of it. Um, but he really wanted to see things in person. Uh, he did buy a handful of things online, um, but he would really, um, you know, drill the person who had posted it for additional photos and any kind of details so that he could really determine um, the authenticity and, and, and certainly the, the quality of the pieces. Um, so there are, there are certainly items that came from overseas. Uh, he collected a few pieces while he was there on various trips to uh, Europe and, and England and so forth, Austria um, and in, in Holland as well. But he always talked about how the vast majority of his collection came from the States because anything that would have been, you know, collected uh, in Europe, you know, was pretty much gone by then. There's not as many uh, items available as they are in the States. Did he have a favorite item or one that he was the, the proudest that he found other than maybe the button? Yeah. Um, yeah, the button was definitely one of the rare treasures. I mean, he always said that he loved all of his children the same. Um, that he didn't have a favorite. Uh, I mean, he really, you know, that bed is just so magnificent and um, is undeniably one of his favorites. Um, but there were certainly, you know, exquisite little portraits. I mean, the that, that lot of the uh, miniatures um, of the women and that old lady, uh, it's, you know, something about that. I don't know, maybe it reminded him of someone in person. Uh, he, he was really um, in love with some of the miniatures and he would oftentimes say, doesn't this look like Marianne or doesn't this look like Robert? Um, he would kind of fall in love with them and, and he would carry them in his pocket uh, like he had a portrait of one of his contemporary friends. And another question, will elements of his collection make their way into institutional collections? He spoke of wanting to have them available for the public to view one day in a setting like those from the exhibition. Yes, uh, as a matter of fact, um, uh, during last year, uh, there was a lot of work that was done with the estate um, 
where George had uh, an interest in working with a number of organizations. Um, the most uh, deepest relationship he had was with Pensbury Manor, uh, which is because of their focus on Charles II, uh, is the beneficiary of a number of pieces of furniture. Um, they have a, number, a wonderful uh, half, like three quarter length portrait in the dining room there um, of Charles II. Uh, and then opposite that, there's a wonderful painting that George requested to them of Catherine of Braganza, uh, Charles II's wife. Um, so Pensbury Manor is certainly one of them. Uh, there's also uh, developing um, pieces that were that were part of the development of a Dutch tavern um, at the New York State Museum. Uh, the opening uh, for that will be in a couple of years, um, but he made a, a small uh, contribution to that tavern room. Um, and then there's a number of other historic houses uh, throughout New York and New Jersey, um, which have also been some of the beneficiaries from the estate of some select items. I mean, it was really items that were just most appropriate to uh, go to those institutions to really just help to tell the story of um, early America. So someone seems to remember reading an article about George years ago and that he actually found something in the trash one time. In the trash? Yeah. Uh, I can't recall that story right now. I'm certainly not surprised. Um, one of my favorite stories is uh, in 2012, after Hurricane Sandy uh, and the huge waves that washed over Manhattan, George was walking um, just past the Staten Island Ferry, coming you know, to and from his home. And he was walking through Battery Park and he looked down and he saw a fragment uh, of a Delft tile, uh, which he's convinced that storm basically washed away the soil. And it's possible that that corner of that fragment of that Delft tile had been in the ground for about 400 years. Um, it could have come from landfill. Battery Park is a lot of landfill. but. You know, he was convinced that it was, it was another one of those revolutionary buttons calling out to him. And we have the last few questions. Um, you were at the apartment, I was at the apartment, and the question is, since he only had the one bedroom apartment, did he have more of the collection elsewhere? There, I mean, there were select pieces that he would have on extended loan. Um, again, Pensbury Manor was one. Uh, we were obviously, well, I shouldn't say we were surprised, but it was a somewhat of a surprise when we were um, looking at some of his closets to find additional paintings and pieces of furniture, um, decorative arts items uh, that for whatever reason were in various um, corners and nooks and crannies. Uh, but yeah, it, you know, it was certainly like a museum going there, but it was a, essentially a warehouse um, of everything. I mean, it was all in there. Uh, he liked to live close with his treasures. Unfortunately, he had high ceiling. Um, you know, there, I think we counted about 250 paintings uh, and then all of the furniture. Yeah, yeah, hundreds and hundreds of pieces. Um, really, really, uh, you know, 50 years of collecting and, and just almost daily on the hunt. Um, George, George was, uh, again, he just had a huge appetite. Um, for these pieces. And when he found one that he loved and, and saw the condition and the quality of it, he, he, he had to have it. And the last question, um, was George ever planning to write a book about his collection? Uh, yes, so, so some of the papers um, that we have from George's that are in these banker boxes uh, include some early drafts uh, of you know, his life story, he tells the story of the Revolutionary War button, he talks about the trip to England um, he talks about some of the artifacts that he would find here and there. He talks about some of the antique shops that he frequented and uh, the friendships that he struck up with some of the dealers. Um, he also talks about uh, the research and the correspondence. Um, but again, unfortunately, it's because of his premature death, uh, it didn't make it quite into a manuscript form. Um, but, you know, it's possible maybe someone will take up that charge. Uh, I mean, I'm obviously deeply in, interested in George and his life um, and, and the deep impact that he had on me. Um, so who knows? We'll see. And finally, a comment rather than a question. Um, following your explanation about how George's collection benefited local historic house sites, it says, we at the Abraham Stats House in Southbound Brook were really pleased and grateful to be able to participate 
as items in the estate were dispersed. The public, when we open again, has and will be able to enjoy George's wonderful pieces on display. Yes, Abraham Stott's house, wonderful house uh, near New Brunswick. Uh, it's not far. If you're in the area of New Jersey, New York, go, go visit it. Really wonderful uh, accessories in there and they have great public programs. Um, yes. And, and okay, one last question, a very short one that we can answer. Um, did George have a day job? Oh yes, um, did I forget to mention? He was a glamorous deli counter catering worker at the Pathmark in Staten Island. George uh, went into the you know catering and food industry right out of high school. Um, you know, unfortunately, his family didn't have the money to send him to college, uh, but he built that entire collection on that salary. I mean, he he was you know it was it was something to admire to watch him negotiate with dealers and and you know various auctions and so forth. Uh, he would get the best price. Um, he had all kinds of strategies and tactics for getting things that he wanted on his very modest income, but he would also do, you know, installments like the uh, three-tiered cupboard. Um, I know that he made a deposit on it and paid it off over a matter of months, but he made a point of taking home one of the drawers to ensure that it was his piece and it wasn't going anywhere. Makes sense. Well, thank you again, Patrick, for a, a wonderful insight to George and his life and the, him as a collector. And uh, please note, everyone, that the items are still much, very much available and on display at our website at uh, www.skinnerinc.com. Uh, sale closes at 7 o'clock on Tuesday, and as they say, bid often. Thanks again, Patrick. Thank you.